Shalom, everybody, and we are uh, in our special uh, study for Kabbalistic insight of Passover according to the Zohar and the Arizal, and some will quote some other Kabbalists and sages. And well, let's see how does that work. Okay, so because it's a very exciting study and with a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, information. Uh, it's not so easy to, uh, to uh, push everything into the very small space of time, uh, uh, length of time that we have. Let's try to be, do, the, do our best. So we, we're starting with what is called uh, the, basic, the basic rules for Passover are being mentioned in Parashat Bo in the book of Shemot, which is in chapter 12 in the book of Exodus. And here it says, and Hashem spoke unto Moses. And it's very important that it says Hashem. Wherever it says Hashem in the Torah, it speaks about Yud K Vav K, the name that we know also we call it the Tetragrammaton, and which symbolizes whoever followed the classes or, and the lessons about the first parashot of the book of Shemot, Exodus, we know that the, the name of Hashem, that name exactly, not, he has many names. This name speaks about grace and chesed and loving and kindness. And when we connect to that aspect of the creator, we are good. Okay, and I'll explain later on. But it's very important to understand that here we're talking about, and Hashem spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt saying, this is after the ninth plague, and here are the instructions for the tenth plague. And we'll see, we spoke about it before, but we'll see that this has been said before the new moon of Nisan. So we are talking about more than two weeks before Passover, before that night of Passover the plague of the firstborn and so on. All what we get over here is the instructions for the Israelites. It's the first time they are participating in the process which is called the 10 plagues. Okay? So, and here it goes, verse two. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. And we learn that in the Hebrew it says lachem, and I explained that in uh, the uh, study about the month of Nisan, Aries, lachem is the same letters of melech, king, which means lachem is also yours. So when it is, it shall be unto you, that's a very poor translation, but what can I do? English is not so good in it. It uh, means it's yours, which means yours to control. If you want to win over the dark kingdom of Egypt, you need to control the forces that the Egyptians are using in order to control you. And Egypt was all about dark magic. And whoever learned a little bit about Egypt and its history uh, knows what I'm talking about. Okay. And then verse three, speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, in the 10th day of this month. So first of all, we know all Jewish writings and commentaries are saying that in that verse that we just read, verse number two, Moses and Aaron are getting the instructions how to announce and sanctify the new month that it's being done in every synagogue till this day, which means the, the Shabbat before the new moon, there is a blessing of the new moon, there's an announcement of the new moon, and, and it's a whole story about the power of the people to control the, the pace of the months. But this is not the time to speak about it, but we understand that that is the whole uh, chapter of what we're just reading is happening 
just to remind everybody, before the new moon of Aries. So it's more than two weeks before what we call Passover, before the full moon of the month of Nisan during the Exodus. Okay, so verse three again. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, in the 10th day of this month, these are the instructions step by step of what should they do. First, they bless the new moon, then they celebrate the new moon on the new moon day, and then on the 10th day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a household. Verse four, and if the household be too little for the lamb, let him, and which means too few people, because I think it was about 50 people per, per lamb. And if it's there's too few people for that, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Number verse five, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. So it could be a lamb or a kid. Six, verse six, and you shall keep it up until the 14th day. So on the 10th day, they took the lamb. Each household took a lamb and they tied it at the house, in the house. Remember the lamb was the idol of the Egyptians, the, the, um, the god Ra was, had a lamb face, the lamb head. And you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the, of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. As I say, kill it, will slaughter it in, at twilight. And they shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door, door post of the house. And the Zohar says it should be in the shape of the Hebrew letter K. We're going to learn about that shape a lot because it is very crucial for the understanding of the whole story of Pesach, wherein they shall eat it. And then, okay, twilight, slaughtering the lamb and then eating it. Verse eight, and they shall eat, remember, this is being said before the new moon. The instructions are already being given. And they shall eat the flesh, the meat, in that night. I'm sorry about, it's very hard to find a translation of somebody who really understands Hebrew. Roast with fire and matzah and with maror, they shall eat it. So why, so the great, Long time question that Jewish kids learn in the kindergarten. Why do we eat matzah unleavened bread on the night of the Seder? And the answer is because the Israelites did not let it rise. Why didn't they let it rise? Because they were told so more than two weeks earlier. So when they eat the lamb, they eat it with a matzah which is bread that is made, basically a cracker, is made from flour that from the moment you wet it with water to the moment it comes out of the oven shouldn't be more than 18 minutes. That's the halachic definition of a matzah and should be just water and flour. And that should be eaten with maro, bitter herbs. They should eat it. So why did they eat it this way? They were told so. Eat not of it raw, not boiled, which means not rare, not boiled. Okay. Uh, not boiled at all with water, but roast with fire. His head with his legs, which means the whole body of the uh, slaughter lamb should be roasted on the barbecue as a whole and with the pertinence thereof. Okay, verse 10. And you shall, you, shall, you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, you shall burn 
with fire. Leave nothing behind. Verse 11, and thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is Hashem's Passover. Again, you should eat it at haste. Remember, they slaughtered the lamb and roasted it at twilight. How long does it take to roast it and to eat it? And by the way, the Israelites left Egypt in the morning after. Why the haste? We should see. For, it will pa for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. And I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute in judgment. I am Hashem. Okay, so remember, this is all being said more than two weeks before the Exodus. And the blood shall be on to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over that you. And that's one of the reasons it's called Passover. I will pass over you. And the plague should not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Verse 14. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And you shall keep it a feast to Hashem throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by the ordinance forever. Verse 15. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Matzah. Okay, so why do we eat matzah? We were told over two weeks before Passover that we should eat matzah for generations after. Even the first day you shall eat, you shall put away leaven out of your houses. Shouldn't be any chametz, any, any leaven, which means anything that is made of flour that rose more than 18 minutes. For whoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. 16. And in the first day, there shall be a, ho a holy convocation. And in the seventh day, there shall be a holy convocation to you. No matter of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat that only may be done of you. Verse 17, and you shall observe the feast of the unleavened bread, which means the holiday of the matzot. For in the self same day, have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, shall you observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. So we can ask many questions. And because why, and that was a special thing is, why is it that we have to eat matzah? So now we're going to go and study from the Arizal, Rabbi Isaac Lorian, the great Kabbalist of the 16th century, born in Jerusalem, lived in Cairo, uh, Egypt for most of his life, spent the last few years of his life in Tzafat among the big congregation of the greatest Kabbalists in the world. At that time in Tzafat, and over there, he taught his teachings that we're still using till today, because without them, we, there's no way we can really understand most of the Kabbalistic texts of the Zohar and other writings from before. Okay, so that's from the Gate of Meditations, chapter one, and we start with the first, uh, with the first uh, paragraph. Hineno dama shamur azal ki otam adorot arishonim. So Rabbi Ezekiel is explaining. What is the background of the story of Passover? Since the sin of Adam and the generations that came after him, there were generations of, you know, we're talking about the generations uh, of Enosh and the, the flood, the Tower of Babylon. All of these generations, they were so much into whatever is wrong like corruption of all possible directions, which means they tried to connect to any kind of energy, excitement, and contentment with every possible way. Black magic, 
sexual transgression, whatever. Everything was exaggerated. And because of their actions, סילקו את השכינה למעלה ברקיע שלי מחמת עבודתם. The Shekhinah had to run away to the seventh heaven just because of their sins. Okay? And you should know, וידע, כי ישראל שהיו באותו דור של שיבות מצרים, the children of Israel that were present at that generation of the Egyptian uh, uh, slavery, in Egypt, the Israelites or the children of Israel that were that time under the Egyptians' uh, slavery, they were coming from, it says the uh, Kabbalistic, uh, the terminology is from the semen of Adam, which is a terminology saying that Adam, after the sin, he was totally lost. He was drawing a uh, very high sparks of souls from above, but he was sending them into the dark side for 130 years after the sin, till the birth of Seth, his son that became the foundation of humanity. Those souls that Adam, through his negative actions of trying to Give to pleasure himself I mean, in different ways, but it's like bringing that energy. So it's called the uh, Keri, Simen, that he was basically drawing it from a very high level. Okay? Those souls were gone into dark, dark side. They came out later on in incarnation and they were born, says the result in the generation of the flood. Those people who created, who were, to, uh, who, the flood is the result of their uh, horrible acts of corruption. They were basically from those souls that Adam drew to the world into the dark side 230 years after the, uh, the sin. And because of that, לכן היו גם הם משחיתים זרם על הארץ. They were also using male semen for witchcraft, for idol worshiping, for all kinds of ways to draw any kind of pleasure and power from above. And the result, because of that, the rain came and removed them from the face of the earth. Okay? But we have to know, says the Ariza, that's the fourth paragraph, in the gates of meditation about Passover. You should know that souls are like gold. Because it's like the ores of gold that you dig from the uh, depth of the uh, earth. When you take it out, it's very, very filthy. It's full of dirt. And it, it's very hard to see gold in there. It doesn't look like gold, it's not fancy as gold, but the, uh, the goldsmith has the wisdom of how to get the gold out of the dirt by burning it, by heating it once after another, purification after purification. Okay, in every purification, it's getting more percentage of gold and less dirt till all the dirt is being uh, separated from the gold. And then you could see it looks like gold. The same thing is about reincarnating souls. Because of the sin of Adam, good and evil got mixed with each other. And that's why you can't find pure gold. You have to find it like with, mixed with, gold, with, with dirt. Especially those sparks we're talking about, the sparks that he drew on the, these 130 years from very high levels. And those parts, they had to go through a process of purification and correction, slowly, slowly, till they started to be corrected and to show the gold within them. And that these were the souls of the Israelites in Egypt.
And therefore, you should understand why it is that they had to go through, through such a terrible slavery that is nothing like it that they went through in Egypt. Because that was to purify whatever they, they sinned during the time of the time of the generation before the flood. And because of that, because of that, then because they did not finish correcting it, all the harm and the dirt they created during that time. So therefore, the decree came, every male boy should be drowned in the Nile. Why? They did not finish that correction of drowning, okay? And because of the sin, it's the same souls who came again in the generation of the Tao of Babel. And what did they do? They said, let us make bricks and build a tower to rebel against God, okay? What was the, uh, what was the payment? It says in Pharaoh and the Egyptians, they were made, they gave the Israelites bitter life with making bricks. Here again. And now we're going to something a little bit deeper than that. What it says now is that, and because of all of that, and because all of these souls came from that sefira, which is called Da'at. Da'at is the, uh, the connection. It's when Chokhmah and Bina, we're talking about the tree of life, and the upper three are Kete, Chokhmah, Bina. But when Chokhmah and Bina are acting towards the, da, the lower levels, they, their action, the united action is called Da'at, which is a level that is still the upper three, but it's the upper three manifesting towards our generation. That in Hebrew means knowledge, but it also means connection. And it's known, says the Ariza, when you God forbid blemish below in any kind of a level, any kind of a attribute or sefira, they, you create, the, you, you cause, that the shells, the clipot, the dark side, will have a grasp on those sephirot that you blemished by your actions. Now the dark side can suck and take the bliss from that source that has been blemished. And therefore, this is the reason why the Israelites had to experience exile in Egypt. Egypt in Hebrew, Mitzrayim, is the narrow place. Why? The place in the body that is the most narrow in the body itself, in the torso, this is the neck. Okay? And the neck is connected to the sephira of Da'at. And Egypt is also the name of the dark side, the dark force that is covering or sucking from that higher dad, which is the neck. So it's called Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim, the narrow place, the neck, and it's called, and the leader of Egypt is known as Pharaoh. Paro in Hebrew is the same letters as Haoref, the neck, okay? So Paro is the neck in the dark, in the be, behind of the dad. And these clipo, these dark forces that are being manifested in the civilization of Egypt and in Pharaoh, they are suckling, they are, and they are holding on and drawing all the bliss coming from that sephira that is called that. And when we say the neck and so on, we're talking about there is a correlation between the, 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 the tree of life sephira and the different parts of the human body because the human body is made in the image, the metaphysical structure of the tree of life. Velachen, Israel, Shayu Boto Adur, 
Therefore, the Israelites that live in that generation, they were from the Sefirah of God, but they were blemished because they came from those souls that, Ad, that Adam drew into the dark side. And therefore, they were enslaved to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians, who basically, they are symbolized, the symbol of the klipa drawing that energy and holding on to it. So the exile in Egypt was for the purpose of the purification and the correction of those holy great sparks. And that's why it said in the, uh, in the, it says in the, in the, in the Torah, Vayotzi etchem mikura barzel mimitzrayim. And God took you out from the iron furnace from Egypt, which means Egypt is being called the iron furnace. What's the iron furnace? This is the furnace in which you put the golden ores and you put it on very high temperature. The dirt is being burnt and the pure gold is being melted and you can purify it step after step till it's becoming the gold. So the same way that the iron furnace purifies the gold, Egypt and the suffering and the pain they inflicted on the Israelites created a long process of purification of those very special souls. Okay. So we have to know that when the dark side are holding on to one of the sefirot, God forbid, because of the bad deeds of humans, the, the bliss, the flow of flight goes away from that place. Same way, what happens when we are connecting to the uh, socket, you know, electricity, in an illegal way, okay? That draws from this network huge amount of energy because it's called a short circuit. The electric company protects itself and the result will be if you don't have, you know, if the, your house is not wired by code, if it's wired by code, so according to the code, so they, uh, there should be those, uh, those uh, connectors that pop when it is going through a too high drawing of energy, okay? And if not, then the uh, electric company will protect itself and they that will be a blackout, okay? Because the, the power company does not want to be simply uh, experience a, a disaster of total destruction. So it will be local, locally controlled. So again, the same thing in the spiritual world. When, the lower, when humans connect to one of the sephirot and they connect in a very illegal connection, which means it's drawing the light in a way that is totally selfish without any limitations, and that's the same thing as a short circuit, by the way, with a nose electricity, then something will pop and light will stop flowing into that place. So the dark side won't take too much power. So reality is that when Pharaoh and Egypt hooked on the upper sephirah of Da'at during that generation, the network needed to pop. And the Kabbalistic expression of it, that Zeranpin, the sephirah that comes after Da'at, the sephirah that is basically the manifestation of the sephirah of Da'at in the lower levels, that sephirah had to be neutralized so the Egyptians cannot connect through it to the main power station. So what happened? Zeranpin went upwards and disconnected from the lower levels. 
as it is, and it's called, it's like a fetus, like a child. Zerampin, one of the names of Zerampin is a child, Ben, a son. Okay, the firstborn. That's what the name of the firstborn is coming over here. And the Sephira, the upper level, where does where does a son go back? If, they, if a child can go back to his mother's womb, the mother is called also Ima, the upper mother, Sefirat Bina. So if there's too much uh, of a hold of the dark sides on that level, then Zerampin and that have to, must go up like a child going back to its mother's womb. Okay? Because every Sefira it was is was given birth by the Sefirai Babi. Okay? And that is called three are included in three, as we know, which means all of those Firot are being going up, okay, like a telescopic antenna, and they are hidden in, like a drawbridge. In the ancient days, how do you protect a castle? There's a drawbridge and nobody can cross. So the drawbridge, which is Zerampin, is being drawn up back to its mother's womb and is cannot be uh, recognized. Okay? ונמצא כי גלות מצרים, אשר חזר זרנפין להיכנס לסוד דיבור, תוך אי מיילן, היה שם אז בבחינת ג' כללן בגיגן, כדי שלא יתאכזוק ליפול בו וינקו שפע ממנו. But what does that mean? When we talk about that זרנפין is not available, we have to understand that זרנפין has also another manifestation which is Hashem. We, we spoke about the name Yud K. Babke represents Zerampin. What does it represent? It represents that consciousness that every human who goes through a real spiritual transformation, he cannot go through it without connecting to that Sefirah that is called Zerampin or the sun. You have to connect to that Sefirah. That Sefirah is, is a is a tool, a vehicle, to draw the godly light from the upper sefirot. But we experience it as experiencing God's love and kindness and grace. That is a sefira of Zerampin. Okay. Now, what you understand that if you don't have the ability to connect to Zerampin, now you can understand that if you read uh, texts that were found in libraries in the ancient world, the ancient world was a very dark place. I, I spoke about it many times, but if you learn mythologies of ancient religions, it's all about basically a kind of a preaching or conditioning of the crowds of the masses to be obedient. You have no hope whatsoever. Life is dark because the gods are really not merciful. They are all very selfish. The king is a god by himself and he will continue to torture you and to rob you and you have no hope whatsoever. That was the massive brainwashing of the ancient world. And that's how you could, a king could own his subjects. There were no citizens, they were subjects, they were property of the king. Their religions were, and the witchcraft, and all the stuff the, the royals did, and or the elite was doing, was one thing and one thing alone. How to create a system in which you can subject all the people under your control and even more and turn them into your slaves. So everything they own belongs to you without even a thought of hope uh, permitted. You need to create a whole religion. And also it was the state was there according to the Rizal. What we read here is that the whole world was in darkness of Egypt that no one 
not just the Israelites. No one had hope. No one was able to connect to that consciousness, that frequency of I am a free human being. I have the right to be happy. Okay, let's continue. Omdam Moshe Rabbeinu Alav Hashanah Bemarei Asnei, Shu Be'inyan Galut Mitzrayim, When Moses on Mount Sinai, as a shepherd of his father-in-law's sheep, saw the burning bush, Hayach Hoshev, he was thinking that because of the Israelites, of that generation, his own people, that he ran away and left them behind in Egypt, they caused that the Dat and the Anpin, all of that, and the ten sefirot of that, of that light went up to the upper levels and disconnected, as we said, like a drawbridge. And therefore, the tikkun, because the tikkun is a tikkun of the tetragrammaton level, the zerampin, so the tikkun should be like ten sefirot in the level of zerampin. The level of zerampin is the gematria, the numerical value of Hashem, Yud is 10, He is 5, Vav is 6, we have two He, so it's 26. 10 Sefirot, you get 260 years. Now, so Moses was sure that the, that the uh, real dark days of the Israelites in Egypt, to be able to, to uh, purify themselves, they had to go through 260 years of suffering. And that's why it says when Moses goes to see the burning bush, it uses the verb sal. Sal. In Hebrew, you don't need, this is a very rare verb, and it's not used for that. Moses came to see, you could use other verbs for that, but he uses the verb sal. Sal is a number also, not just a verb the number 260, which means Rabbi Ezra Gloria is teaching us because to his understanding, Moses, he was sure that the sin was connected to the 10 times the name of God, Yud Kei Vav Kei, which is 260. And therefore, the, the dark suffering must be 260 years. And according to that, it's not the time for the redemption because it was only 210 years that passed from the beginning of the suffering and the enslavement. So, but God said to him, no, because the Anpin went up and the Dat went up to be now, it's not 260 years, but something else. What it is, this is the name of Bina. It's connected to Bina because the Anpin is right now part of Bina. And the name of Bina, when you connect to God through using the Sefirah, Sefirah means illumination, a sphere, but it's also illumination, like a sapphire, illuminating stone. It's a Hebrew word, by the way. Okay. And that is the name Ehye. And from there, the dark side is trying to suck at that time. And that's why their, their reign will be not 260 years, but 210. As it says, when God told Jacob to go down to Egypt, he used the verb redu, go down. Redu is also in because it's also the number 204 and, and, and 10. So it was hinted in two places. And that's why when Moses said, who sent me? Who is sending me? So he said, who? You tell the Israelites that Eheye sent me. Okay? Translated wrongly into I am what I am. <laughs> okay? No, it is Eheye Asher Eheye. Eheye is the name of God when you connect to him through the Sefirah of Bina. Okay, remember Zanpin was not available at that time. He was back in his mother's womb, like a drawbridge that was pulled back to the tower. And the tower is Bina. And Bina is Eye. Eye is 21. 10 Sefirot to 210. Which now, now, so what is being revealed right now in the whole stages and the whole, all the stages of the redemption 
are dependent on the number 210 and not 260. And therefore, God revealed the secret to Moses. This is the time of the redemption and you, are, you were not aware of it. You thought it's going to be in 50 years from now. No, this is the time. Go over to Egypt and get them out. Vine, so the Ari Zal is continuing, Rabbi Isaac Noyer. Paro Arasha, the wicked Pharaoh, he was a great wizard, no one like him. Why? Because he was surrounded with wizards, and if one of them was more powerful than him, he would become Pharaoh, he will kill the original Pharaoh. No sentiments, the moment, you know, that power is the only think that, you know, you're really careful. And he knew in his wisdom the whole story about Zeir and Pin not being available. That was purposely, he knew that. In, on one hand, he knew that he cannot draw too much power from the upper worlds, okay, through his dark magic. Still, he was successful because that frequency that is called hope, independence, uh, freedom, and creativity, and the consciousness that I am destined to be happy and no one is allowed to take it away from me. That consciousness was not available because of the dark magic. Pharaoh knew that exactly. And therefore he knew that the Anpin, which is called Hashem, or Yud Kevav Kei, he knew that that's not the ruling power in the world right now, since all the black magical power machine, the whole age, it was built around it. You know, who, how many people didn't, you know, how many people did not hear about the dark magic of the mummification, the mummies and the witchcraft of Egypt? You know, politically correct, you don't talk too much about it. But if you really read about Egypt, it was all about that, all about dark powers and dark magic and curses and so on. And therefore, when Pharaoh knew exactly what's going on. So when Moses came to him, Pharaoh totally was against it. He was totally a, 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 like we could call it a heretic. And he said, I did not know Hashem. Why? Because he knew that because that his dark forces are so powerful, Hashem is not available. And therefore he says, I don't know Hashem. He totally denied the existence of Hashem. And he said also, who is Hashem? That I will listen to him, that I will obey to his command. He doesn't, he doesn't exist. Okay? Because there's Zeran Pin, or Hashem that you are saying that you are the messenger of, where is he? I can't, I can't connect to him because I know he is not available. He is not controlling, he's not there. He went back to his mother's womb, cosmically, like a child that was born and ran back to his mother's womb. Of course, in the physical world, it does not, it cannot happen, but in the spiritual world, it happened already. And that's why it says, and God and Hashem made the heart of Pharaoh strong. What does it mean? Because whenever he heard, whenever, Hashem, when Pharaoh, whenever Pharaoh was hearing the name of Hashem for Moses, that made him even more stubborn. It's like, like it doesn't exist. What are you talking about? He just, you know, you, you have no idea what's going on over here. Because in his wisdom, he knew that Hashem cannot be revealed to the world at that time. So, for the reality is, says Rabbi Hakur, that the whole issue of the redemption from the exile of Egypt was by a great, great, powerful miracle. And that's the greatest of the miracle of the, of the Exodus. It was not just Hey guys, come over, let's fight, let my people go. No, no. They, they, only a huge miracle could really 
uh, destroy the dark power of Egypt and reveal the great light of Hashem, which is the power of the human consciousness of hope, grace, and happiness. Kingdom in Mitzrayim of all, with Egypt and Pharaoh, they were so connected to the to the da, to the upper dad that which means there was no way but to emanate from above a new birth of Zeranpin and to bring him into that birth of Zeranpin into the the outermost, the biggermost, the, this strength in order to remove all the dark forces holding on it. Why? The, when the light is big enough, those dark forces will be burnt. And now the Israelites can get out of exile. So, and therefore, we understand the symbolism of the Passover story. When we are saying, and I'm reading right now from the Zohar Parashat Bo, verse 166. And that's what Rabbi Shimon said. Whenever it says in, we just read from Genesis, from Exodus 12, on the first day you will remove any leaven, any rising sourdough from your homes. Because whoever does eat all of that, the soul will be cut off. So this, Rabbi Shimon said, Seor umachmetzet. Sourdough. You know, sourdough is coming from Hebrew. In Hebrew, the biblical is seor. In English, sour. You know, that, that culture, one, now we know it's a culture of bacteria that they make the, uh, the uh, they, by their fermentation, they make the dough rise. Okay? So the sourdough and the yeast, that part is one level. And the one level which is symbol of negativity, the symbol of uh, the symbol of selfishness. It's a symbol of the dark side, Reshut Acherit. This is the another authority, the authority of the dark forces. Hem asarim amemonim asharim. And they are the angels that are responsible for all the nations. We call them, ואנחנו קוראים אותם יצר הרע. We call them the evil inclination. רשות אחרת, the other authority. אל נחר, idol worshiping. אלוהים אחרים, other gods. אף כאן, over here the same, שאור מחמצת, sourdough and yeast. All of it is called חמץ. חמץ is another word in Hebrew for sour. Okay? Usually more in, in today's Hebrew, you use when you say that something is sour, use the word chamutz more than seo. So you use it only rarely for sourdough. Hakol echadu, it's all the same thing. Amar HaKadosh Baruch so God said, all of the, kol ha'elo shanim amadatem b'mshut acheret, all of these years, you were under the control of the other side. Why? You brought yourself into it, correct? During the flood, during the Tower of Babylon, it was all about trying as much as possible to be under the authority of the dark side. Why? Because for people relinquishing their selfishness, this is almost impossible. And because of that, because you were slaves to your own selfishness, your own darkness, the result was that you became slaves to another nation. From now on, mikano lehala, shatem bnei chorin, from now on that you become free people. Ach bayom harishon tashbitu sori batechem. Which means, what is the story about not eating leaven, sourdough, and any kind of, of dough that rose is because this is in the physical world, the epitome, the manifestation, the branch of the upper power of darkness and selfishness. So now 
when you understand why we ate matzot on Passover, it's not because we had to run away from Egypt in a hurry and we had no time to bake the bread. We were told to bake matzot more than two weeks earlier. So why we did not, whoever been, whoever been to a matzah factory, okay? You see over there like handmade matzah factory. You see how everybody's waiting, everything is clean, all the dishes, all the tables, everything really clean, clean. So there's nothing, nothing there that can rise and become sour. And then they pour the water, cold water, into uh, the flour and they start kneading it, but they beat it up so badly. So when it goes into the oven, it's like, it's so uh, uh, squatted, it's so thin. And then you, you uh, uh, go on it and make the, the holes on it. So really to press it so it does not rise. So what is a matzah? It's exactly the opposite of bread. What is bread? Leaven. It's rising and rising and rising like the ego, like selfishness. It's all about me. Give me, give me, give me, and I'm not giving anyone anything. So the physical manifestation of the, of, of the evil inclination is the rising sour dough. Oh, the dough that rises with yeast. This is what it is. Or oh, even without yeast, with gluten. And that's why, by the way, so many people today have gluten uh, allergies because gluten creates gluttony. Gluten cre is, is creating uh, addiction. And that's why if you notice today, I, I realize it's, it's really shocking. All of these health food stores, you go and you buy spelt bread, why? Because spelt is a wheat that did not go through the very intensive uh, genetical engineering like the regular wheat. That's why regular wheat is not made for human consumption. Okay? It's, it's a very industrial material. Spelt is wheat that did not go through that uh, genetic engineering. Therefore, it has one of the uh, good things in spelt that he has a less amount of gluten. Same thing with the other grains, like uh, oats, like uh, barley, like other grains that are considered to be healthier. However, today you go to health food stores and you buy that spelt beautiful bread. And you look at the ingredients, they add with gluten to it so it will rise faster. Why? Because when it has tripled the amount of gluten, then in spelt, it rises faster, so it's good for the baker, not for our consumption. Okay, so so all five grains that are considered to be leaven, to be chametz in Pesach, contain gluten. Uh, uh, other grains, like let's say rice, it's not really considered chametz because it does not have gluten. All five grains have gluten. So you cannot have it in your house during or under your ownership during Pesach. Okay, that's one thing. But if it is a matzah, the matzah must be made from these five grains. You cannot have a matzah from rice. It's not a real matzah. So, Amar Kadosh Bohu, all of those days, what we said on the first day, do not have leaven, do not have sourdough at your or under your ownership during that time. Okay, so either you give it away or you sell it. If you don't have any, if you have like a uh, commercial amounts, you sell it to somebody else. Don't own it. So you should not have any chametz under your possession. Why is it called matzah? Says the Zohar. That's a Zohar of Parashat Pinchas, verse uh, 703. We learned Shaddai. You know, there's a name, one of the names of God, Chin Dalid Yud. It's a name 
that is in most of the mezuzahs department on the parchment you have it sometimes on the uh, on the uh, case the mezuzah case you have shin dalavud. Perusho the meaning of shin dalavud misha mar lo lamo dai. In Hebrew shin dalavud is also shedai that said enough, which means the holiness God is the only one who can say enough to put a stop to our troubles. The Hainu, which means, when we connect to the light side, opposite to the dark side, the light is the only thing that drives away the darkness. So when you connect to the light, the light had that power to put a limit to darkness and pain and misery. Same thing is Matzah. Mishum shehi machriya u machniya. The power <coughs> of matzah. We have to understand how we know, how do you create a vaccination? You, you need to take something of the uh, disease and you need to make it weaken. So by that injection of the weak uh, negative, you create a reaction that that reaction allows the body to fight the virulent. The disease, okay? So what, so what is matzah? You take dough with gluten, okay? That is made of the five grains, as we said, like oats, uh, wheat, barley, um, there's some, there two others, okay? And you take those, take that bread, but instead of bread, you don't let it rise, you weaken it. You create by this a vaccination, okay? Matzah is the same because you machriya u machniya. Matzah is the power to overcome and subdue the, the darkness inside each one of us when we eat it. The hainu shemavrachat lechol sabim rain. All dark sides, matzah makes them run away. Osam meriva bain. Matzah fights them the same way the name Kain Hashem Shin Daledyut Shalom Mezuzah. The same way the name Shin Daledyut on the Mezuzah fights the darkness not to approach the house. Shemavriach Lashadim, it makes all the demons and dark forces at the gate to repel, to move out and run away because the power of the Mezuzah. The Afkach Matzai Mavrichauta Mikom Mishkinot Kedusha. The Matzah has the power to drive away all of those dark forces from the dwellings of the holiness. The Osa Meriva Uktata Vayem, and the Matzah is fighting them. Kemosha Ma Masa Umeriva. There's a uh, there's expression fight and and quarrel in the in the Torah. And, but that's why it says matzah, matzah like masa. Masa with, with a samech, with an S, not with a T-S, which is a tzaddik. Shoel, I masa in samech. But masa, fight, and quarrel is with the letter samech, not with the letter tzaddik. Lo in tzaddik, who meshiv, and Rabbi Shimon answers, ela targumo shel masa, but if you go to the translation of masa into Aramaic is matzuta. So you see that the Samich and the, and the uh, Tzaddik are replaceable, are uh, interchangeable. And that's why Matzah is, means also fight. So what is a Matzah? Matzah is a remedy against any selfishness and evil within us. So when we eat the Matzah only on the seven days of Passover, we basically eat a healing bread, a medication, a remedy against any kind of negativity inside us. So, now, the commentary of Rabbi Nisim Peretz, the great Kabbalist uh, in blessed memory, of blessed memory, that he and my teacher, that explained how do you bring it down, this understanding. And it says in the Zohar, Rabbi Elazar is asking his father, Rabbi Shimon, after he explained to him what's so powerful, you know, 
why we're not eating chametz, leavened bread on Passover, why we should clean the house so it doesn't exist in the house, because we don't want any connection during Passover to any negativity and darkness because we want to be free, free. And that's why the name of Passover, one of the names is Chag HaChirut, the Holy Day of Freedom. Freedom of what? We all know that when we do not have any evil inside us, any desire to receive for the self alone, any selfishness, any narrow-mindedness, Mitzrayim, that's when we are free. That's when we are free to be the people we were supposed to be, the deep inside we'd like to be. Just think about it. Do kind of a meditation and write down, if you don't have any negativities inside you, any selfishness, any fears, really no negativity, okay? How would your life look like? How would your life look like? Okay? And give it the time to contemplate on it. You'll see amazing results. Passover is our opportunity to get rid of as many negativities as possible through removal of the chametz from our possession, one, two, eating the matzah. Okay, so because the chametz is a connection to the dark side and its forces that have to be eliminated, so the whole thing about the matzah eating the matzah, the Zohar says it's called Nahama Dimhemnuta, the bread of faith. Why, what is faith? Faith, emuna in Hebrew really means connection. Real faith means that I'm really connected to the upper world, to the godly, holy, spiritual, positive powers. Okay, when I'm connected to there, what kind of thoughts do I have? What kind of emotions? Do I have? Do I feel only positive that allow me to be creative, to be giving, and to connect to greatness? Okay? So Rabbi Elazar is asking Rabbi Shimon, his father, if the matzah is such a remedy against negativity, why only seven days? Why shouldn't be doing that the whole year long? You know, a lot of people don't eat bread anymore. They, are, they try to have gluten-free food for the whole year long. You realize that's exactly the question of Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Elazar. We should be away from that the whole year long. Amar lo Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon, his father answered. All days of Pesach, the days of Pesach, the seven days of Pesach, they are the root for the whole year. For the whole year. What do you call the, the celebration we do at the night of Passover? We call it Seder. Do you know what Seder means in Hebrew? Order. What happens when we remove negativity, selfishness, darkness, and, selfish, and all of those emotions that are connected to negativity? Everything becomes from chaotic, becomes order. That is the night of order, Leil HaSeder. We inject order to our lives by avoiding the chametz and by eating the matzah as a remedy for our negativity. And therefore, everybody knows very well what happens when somebody has, you know, with conventional medicine, somebody has a, like a very advanced level of infection goes to ER, and then to ICU, and the first thing they do, they give him overdose, a huge dose of antibiotics, right? Same thing, the first night of Passover, we get four doses of matzah, four. And then for the next seven days, we get it two times a day with the food, like medication. Because, you know, during the holiday, you know, it is customary to make a meal. It's not considered a meal if you didn't do hamotzi on bread, but on Passover, there's no bread, you eat matzah. 
so you eat a meal day and night, so you have the remedy, uh, you take it for seven days. The moment the seven days are over, the treatment is done, it's finished. The tikkun is in the root level, seven days of Passover. If you did the tikkun, the correction in the root, in Pesach, you don't have to be careful with it the whole year long, which means it will give you an immune immunity for another year. Then comes Passover again. You have another healing treatment that is called Pesach and Matzah. That's why it's called also one of the names, Chag Matzot, the holy day of the Matzot. Kluma, which means a person that is very careful on the night of Passover in two things. One, being very careful not to have around any chametz, which means your utensils are specially cleared from chametz. I'm not here about the rules, the rules you can find, how to clean the house, how to get rid of the chametz and stuff, stuff like this. No chametz should be in the house, okay? You shouldn't eat from uh, utensils that are using chametz, okay? Usually, unless you cleanse them first, and the way there's, you know, usually either to boil them or to uh, put them on fire, depends on the different laws, okay? Now, if you're careful to avoid chametz for the seven days, and also doing the positive mitzvot of that night, which is eating matzah, maho, and all, all the sort of the seder, you have an ability, you get on Pesach, an ability to be free of the evil inclination for the whole year. You won't get it in a total level, but every year you will see your situation is better because you go through the treatment every year on Passover. And that's why it says in the writings of Rabbi Isaac Roya that whoever is very careful about the chametz and the matzah in Passover, he is he can be promised that he won't be sinful during the whole year. Why? Because his evil inclination won't bother him too much during the year. This is the reason and the purpose and the whole scope of what Pesach is for each one of us. So there's a question that Rabbi uh, Nisim Peretz is asking. How can we promise a person that if he's going to be very careful on Pesach, all seven days, not to be connected, not to eat, not to own chametz. Okay? That he won't have an evil inclination for the rest of the year. We see that a lot of people that do really observe Pesach really carefully to the, to the dot, okay? They still have inclinations during the year. So how, how can you say something like this? And the answer is, of course, you will have evil inclination during the year. Without the evil inclination, you have no uh, correction. You have no tikkun. You don't have any real, real true challenges. Because the whole purpose of our existence in a body is to have an evil inclination, to overcome the evil inclination. And that's the only way we can attain real spiritual life, by, by stepping up and overcoming those negativities. However, the person will have challenges and fights and opportunities, but he will have more ability to overcome, okay? He will have more chances, more probability to be the winner. Why? Because he did not give the evil. How do you call evil in Hebrew? Ra. What was the name of the uh, god of Egypt? Ra, the lamb god, okay? Which means on Pesach, you didn't give them power in the seed level, then the whole year long, you'll have more powers to win in your challenges. That's why it's called the night of Seder order. When we win over our evil inclination, we experience more order and less chaos every day and minute in our lives. Now, so what do we do? The first thing is we clean the house, okay? We clean, it's not a spring cleaning. 
We clean the house so wherever there is usually chametz, bread, cookies, cakes, whatever, pasta, stuff like this, you have to make sure to clean it. Okay? Whatever bread you have in the house, get it out of the house. Okay? Whatever utensils that you're supposed to use for Passover, okay, make sure that they, they are clean for Passover and kosher for Passover. And that you have food that was made specially for Passover. Uh, because it was uh, made in a way, but what's specially for Passover? Like whatever is not chametz, like fruits and vegetables, this is not, cannot be chametz, right? So you buy them in the marketplace. But I think there must be many, many, many instructions on the internet how to get kosher for Passover food. Okay, so the food that is processed has to come from a factory that what, there was a supervision that it, there's not going to be any chametz in that factory that will go into the food. Okay, same thing with wine and drinks and stuff like this. Now, after the house is clean, the night before Passover, or if Passover is on Saturday night, like this year, the night, bef the night of Thursday night, a week from now, the night, the Thursday night, they, or the night, usually the night before, Rarely you have Passover on Sunday, so then the night before it's Friday, you cannot do it, so you do it on Thursday night. Okay, so what do you do after sunset, when it's dark? You do what is called the checking of the chametz. Okay, the checking of the chametz, the minimum thing to do on the checking of chametz is to turn off all the lights in the house, light only a candle, one candle, a candle, not the uh, flashlight candle. Why? When, when do we use candles? When we want to connect to the world beyond. Shabbat is coming. Did anybody see the Shabbat coming? No. How can you connect to the, the Shabbat that is coming in? That power that is moving into your dwelling, into your neighborhood. The Shabbat is coming and the way to connect is by lighting Shabbat candles. Somebody passed away, you want to connect to the soul, you light a candle for that person's soul. You cannot see the soul, okay? So why do we light? If we want, want to go and look for the chametz in the house, should be daylight with a flashlight, okay? No, with a candle, because we are looking for the real spiritual chametz, not just the physical. <coughs> so the leader of the house, is holding the candle, is holding the blessing, and he says the words before the blessing, which you can find it out in the prayer books for Pesach or in the Haggadot. Some of the Haggadot, most of the Haggadot have it. And you say the prayer before, before uh, checking the chametz. Then you say the bracha, the blessing uh, of checking the chametz, and then you do not speak. Nobody speaks till you find the chametz in the house. So, but the house is clean. There's no chametz in the house. Oh, so the tradition is, according to Rabbi Isaac, you take small pieces of chametz, of bread, or cake, or cookie, or something like this, okay, corresponding to the 10 sefirot of impurity. But small pieces, tiny, small, very small pieces, wrap them with paper, okay, and then put them in somebody, not the one, the seeker, but somebody else should put the 10 pieces in 10 places in the house, usually on the floor, so you don't dirty something. Okay, it should be wrapped. And then you go and you look for them according to the 10 levels of the clipboard, from Malchut till Keter. Okay, and after, the house is being cleared from these 10. The meditation is to collect all the negativity that is stored in that house by all the people who live in that house. Okay? That belong to the, to the soul of the people living in that house. Okay? After you finish collecting the seeker, finish collecting all the 10 pieces and don't touch the pieces when you find them, Usually you take a cardboard or you can find a kit in Judaica stores. 
in many places. You have a kit with a, uh, a with a spoon made of wood, with a wooden spoon and a feather, like in old times. But if you a piece of cardboard, can do that also. And you collect it with the cardboard, and you put it in a paper bag. So, and when you find the tenth piece, then you stop, and then everybody says together, if there's a you know the whole uh, people who live in the house, say together three times the text that it says whatever chametz. I own that I saw and I didn't see. I disown them. They do not belong to me forever. And you say it three times. So you say it usually people say it in Aramaic, but you have to understand what you say. And if you don't know, you, you, so they, in our Haggadah, you have that you can find the link down in the link uh, under the movie. So you, what you do is you say the blessing and you say uh, the uh, the words that basically it's called nullification of the chametz. So after you said that, if there is any chametz crumbs hidden that you couldn't find in this in the sofa, you know, babies, kids, you know, you whoever, it, it's not yours anymore. So if you find it during the holiday, you burn it outside. You take it outside and you burn it. But it's not a transgression, it's not yours. You disown it. But you also disown all negativity within yourself. Okay, and it is known from the words of the great rabbi of Brisk that he says that all the mitzvot of the night of Passover, it's very hard to, uh, it's very easy to, to, to follow them. But there's one halacha, one mitzvah that is very hard to obey and to follow which is that every generation, a person must see himself like he is going out of Egypt, like he's experiencing personally the Exodus right now. You have to see yourself that you are being redeemed from your own Pharaoh. Why? Because if you think about it, all our troubles, the lack of good luck, good fortune, fights and this functionality that we have, all of this is a result of our negativity that we own. We have first to acknowledge it and then to disown it exactly like the Hamid. You have to find it, okay? Collect it and get rid of it, okay? And disown it. So we are not just talking about something of the, of the past. Oh, there was something really great. They changed the history of humanity. 34 centuries ago, when the Israelites left Egypt and the whole consciousness of Hashem, Yud Kei Vav Kei, love and grace and, and, and sharing has been, and hope was, was born to the universe, humanity started to be redeemed and the process continues till today. And this is really uh, applicable to every moment of our lives because we find slavery everywhere, especially those people who blame others for enslaving them. If you don't have a consciousness of real responsibility and accountability for your own slavery within, there's no way that anyone can redeem you. Blaming others, putting the responsibility on others, that's the talk of a slave. First, you need the slave to redeem himself or herself. So that is the process of Passover. We need to connect to that frequency in order to achieve real freedom in our career, in our relationship, in our health, in everything. Every aspect of our life is being influenced by what happens in this night. So... Every person should feel that whatever we do during this Pesach is not just a memorial uh, service for something that happened in the past. We are talking about the real thing, a feel that whatever we're doing, we collect the 10 pieces of chametz is really to remove darkness and evil from ourselves. Okay, that is at that night. So after the, we do, that little ceremony of collecting the chamet, checking the chamet, we put it in a, in a basket that we said, or in a uh, 
bag, paper bag usually, and then put it aside till the morning. In the morning, so if Shabbat, if the morning before the Seder, or if, if the Seder is Saturday night, Shabbat night, we do it Friday morning, then we burn the chametz. We make a little bonfire. We put the pieces of chametz on the bonfire and we really meditate that by the burning of the chametz, we are eliminating darkness. We're eliminating darkness. We're eliminating evil and we make the forces of the dark side worldwide, weaker by our own action. We have the ability because we are all connected. We are all one, the whole planet, the whole of humanity, okay? So the text for that, you can find. And then after the burning, most of the chametz is being burned. You say again, what we said the day before, the night before, the annulment of the chametz, Every chametz that is in my possession, I disown it. It doesn't belong to me. It uh, has care like a soil. I don't care for it. Whoever finds it, it's his. I don't have any ownership and I annul my connection to it. You'll find the text, as I said, in uh, Pesach uh, prayer books or in the Haggadahs. Most Haggadahs has it, have it in the text in the beginning. Okay. So, now we come to the meaning of the plague of the firstborn that happened on the night of Passover, the first night of Passover. Rabbi Elazar said, Amar Rabbi Elazar, this we are reading from the Zohar, uh, Parashat Shmot, verse 320. Rabbi Elazar said, The God of Egypt was a land. And God ordered to destroy it, to burn it on in fire, to barbecue, not to burn because they ate it. Kemadat Amaz, it says, Silei Elohim Tisafon Baish, and it says in the Torah, the, the statues of their idols you should burn in fire. Kedeshi Elohon Nodef, why on fire? The smell should go around because the Egyptians had to be treated also. You have to, to roast it on fire. You have to roast it on fire, remember? Not, on, not boil it in water because Aries, Tale, Tale means a lamb, okay? Aries means a ram, but in Hebrew it means a lamb, okay? You f is a fire sign. You fight fire with fire. We know that the evil inclination is being called in the scriptures fire. So when you roast, when you slaughter the land and you roast it on fire, open fire, you, the meditation of the Israelites was to basically destroy the Ra, the God of Egypt, the land God of Egypt. Ra means in Hebrew evil. And so everybody will see it's a lamb and not a chicken and not something else and not a... Not a other kinds of meat, okay? And then after they finished eating, they threw the bones in the marketplace to disgrace the idol. And that was the Vezota Italian Mitzayim Kosham Mikula. That disgrace was so hard to the Egyptians, but they were finished. Hadar Shpatim, that's what it says, to destroy them. Amar Rabbi Yudah, Rabbi Yudah said, Be'elohem Mamash, but Rabbi Yudha said, in their gods, really in their gods, because they didn't roast it just to make, to mock the Egyptians. That was a meditation. Can you think about almost 3 million Jews, they were Israelites, not Jews at the time, <coughs> in groups, roasting the lamb, slaughtering and roasting the lamb, while thinking about destroying their gods the power of idol worship. I call it the biggest voodoo ceremony in the history of humanity. The result was the fall of the Egyptian empire. They never came back 
to their powers. They never built pyramids anymore. They never became for long-term empire as they've been before. And the result was, if God Hashem al Marom Marom, God is going to visit and punish the armies of the heavens and the kings of the earth. Al Malchei Adama Al Adama. Because Ayu Yudim Chachamim Shabayim. And the wizards in Egypt, they saw, they saw it, they knew what's happening. And they really, they knew what's going on. Because Shekin Asar Shalem and also the angel of Egypt, they had a ruling angel. That angel has been destroyed. Alken, Ktiv, Avav, and Yitchak Malu. They knew all of it and they were afraid of it. That's why their story was that they are torturing the Israelites so the Israelites are not going to fight them. And we know what happened. The next mitzvah, okay, after the matzah, we explained about the power of the matzah and how important it is to remove the leaven, to remove the chametz, and to have, to eat matzah in the night of Passover with the lamb, okay? We don't have that lamb now because we don't have the temple, God forbid, but you know, Bezrat Hashem will have soon. HaMitzvah shel Achazo, the next mitzvah, says the Zohar, Parashat Bo, verse 179, is to tell the story and, the pray, and to praise the story of the Exodus. Every person must tell that story. We already explained. Telling the story of the Exodus, that's a reading of the Agaga. And he's excited while telling the story. He's going to rejoice with the Shekhinah in the world to come. It's a it's a double-sided happiness in the physical level and in the spiritual level. Rejoicing with that, with that, that night and being happy, this is a way to worship the Creator and to be thankful. And what I mean to worship? By this, you can draw in the awesome power we're going to read about that is being revealed that night. And God is happy when the person is telling the story. Rabbi Isaac Luria is saying, Pe Sach could be divided into two words in Hebrew, Pe, a mouth, Sach, speaking. Okay, speaking what? The Rizal is saying, Sach is also written Samechet. Samechet is 68, the same Gimatria as Chaim, life. You, but while, while telling the stories with happiness, during the night of the Seder, you are drawing in the power of life, the light of wisdom, the power from Sfirat Chokhmah that can burn any negativity that night and create life for every person. Why? The moment you remove negativity, there's no death anymore. We continue. Verse 182. You're going to ask, why it's so important to tell them the miracles? God knows everything. He knows what was, what is, and what will be. All of it. Why do you have to publicate, publish it and you know, promote it, he knows that. And the answer is, you should every person should publish it and talk about it and promote the story. Why? Because the words of the person reading the Haggadah and speaking about the miracles of Passover and the Exodus, those words come up. And all the armies of the angels above see them coming up. And that makes all the forces in all the other dimensions to be under the power of God without any chaos. 
So when we say man nishtana laila ze mikol alo, Rabbi, what's the difference between this light and this night and all the other nights? The most famous song of the Passover say, the man nishtana laila ze, what's the difference between this night and the other nights? Shebechol alaylot enano mim halel balayla. There's not one night along the year that we say Hallel on that night. The prayer of praises from Psalms with a blessing. We do not, there's not one night, even one, not Rosh Hashanah, not Sukkot, not even Yom Kippur. Why? Because the level that we reach on the night of Passover is, cannot be reached in any night along the year, only on Passover. And this night, the night of Passover, we say the Hallel twice. Once in the, the evening prayer, Arvit, of before, uh, in the beginning of the evening, in the synagogue. That's an evening prayer, or you have it, in, you cannot go to the synagogue, you have it in the uh, prayer book. Once we say the Hallel for Passover night, it's the only night we say the Hallel in the synagogue or during the prayer of Arvit, the evening prayer of Fest Passover. And then at home, during saying the Agada, we say the Hallel second time. It's such a great level in that night. So it's not a simple night, it's a very special one. And that is what our sages said in the Midrash. That that night, when our forefathers left Egypt, God make it shine like it was in the middle of a midsummer holiday. It's like a midsummer shining light, sun. Simply, like this, simply that the sun was shining at night like in the middle of the day. Just a second, it's not relevant because everybody was at home. We were told not to get out of the house. So who cared? Now we're talking about the light. Spiritually, it was so strong, okay? So sort of like the sun was shining in mid heaven in the midsummer. Okay, but the Ari, the Divra Rashash, she has a mashmut beats on my own. But the Arizal is saying there are illuminations of that night, that the Ara, the illumination of that night is not like the illumination of other nights. It is the illumination that can be found only during daytime and not at nighttime. Okay, it says in the Holy Zohar that on this night, it's not just a great illumination, there's also like a great union between the Shekhinah, which is the creation, the holy side of the creation, and God. It's like a huge union. Above. Okay, and it's not from our side. The union is happening from above, we are not the ones who awaken it. In many holidays, we have to awaken it from below. During Pesach, it's being awakened from above. It's a gift, which means it's not, we get the light on that night, not according to the level of hard work, spiritual work we have by the moment we have reached that place, but it's, the illumination is from above in a huge, Illumination that doesn't care about who we are, righteous or not righteous, it's coming from above. It's a gift. So Rabbi Isaac Luria said in the Gates of Meditation that usually when a person goes through a spiritual illumination, he must go through four steps. And it takes lifetimes to reach those four steps. It takes lifetimes. Many lifetimes sometimes. First step is Mochin de Katnut. It's called the consciousness of smallness. But at least you have consciousness. Number two is Gadlut Rishon, is first greatness. Then number three is second Katnut, smallness. And number four is called second greatness. It's all about mochin. Mochin means connection. It's that those are the forces, the spiritual forces that connect a physical brain and mind and emotions with 
the upper spiritual universe. Without mochin, you are hooked off, which means you're not in tuned, you're not in the, belong, you don't belong to the network. How do you achieve mochin? Hard spiritual work, meditations, training, uh, sharing, caring, mitzvot, learning, all of that stuff, whatever it's about achieving, and especially overcoming emotions, overcoming negativity, overcoming the evil inclination, and by that spiritual fight, you achieve the four, you attain the four levels that you need in order to achieve true, real graceness and true, real freedom. These are the four levels. However, in Pesach, the, the creator sh made the light shine and create a redemption in a very speedy way. The first greatness and the second greatness has been achieved at once and that night of Passover. Why? Because all the sages are saying, if God would redeem the Israelites step by step, first the mochin of katnot of smallness, then gadlu, then greatness, first greatness, then the second greatness, they will not be able to be redeemed. Why? Because the powers, the dark forces of Egypt were too strong. They were already what is called on the four inside the 49th gate of negativity. And if they fell into the 50th gate, there won't be any way to return. There was no time for levels. So, therefore, in order to remove the holding on of the chametz, of the dark side of witchcraft and darkness and negativity and selfishness, which was the basic culture of Egypt. God redeemed their, them with the first and the second greatness at once. So he skipped the levels of smallness and gave them immediately the greatness. How do you say skipping in Hebrew? There are two words, dilug, but also pasach. Pesach means to skip. So there's another meaning for the word pesach because on pesach we do skip. From you could be the smallest, the weakest, the most unspiritual person. But if you come with a pure heart and the desire to the night of pesach, and you just do whatever we just said, you will receive great lights of redemption, the lights of redemption of a righteous man. And that great illumination is being awakened every year on the night of Pesach. So, summary from Rabbi Nisim Peretz, the lights of the redemption they coming in the night of the Seder in two stages. One stage is during the Arvit prayer, the evening prayer, the holiday evening prayer. The, because the prayer is only with words, it's the light, orot apnemiut. It's the internal lights. The meal of the Seder, the Haggadah and the Seder and the meal gets us the external lights. The external lights, which means the vessels. Why? Because it's a physical meal with physical matzah, but it's the same lights coming in, internal during the evening prayer, and the external, it's during the Seder itself. You need both of them. We, from there, we understand that the lights coming in during the prayer of Avit are even higher than the lights coming in during the Seder itself. Okay, so so why if we get such high lights, such a high, amazing, powerful lights, everybody gets those lights. These are lights of prophecy that we get at the night of the Seder. Why don't we immediately, the night, the day after, celebrate Shavuot and get the Torah? That because on the night of the Seder, we get 
up to the Sefira of Chokhmah, which you can't get to that level any any time. So, but in Shavuot we get Keter. Why don't we do that? So simply, according to the Ari, the answer is that whatever we do on the night of the Seder, whatever is done the night of the Seder, it's done, it's called the, the, the above supreme union. That is not from our side. Zivuga dil eila de lo misitra dila. This union is happening without asking us. It's happening every year because still it was created. It was a miracle out of nature that the only way to get the Israelites out of Egypt and to start the journey of humanity towards true freedom, real freedom, not political, mental, spiritual, real consciousness of real true freedom that nobody is to blame. I take responsibility and I create my own life without hurting anybody else, without the need to create any negativity. This is the biggest calling and everybody can get that light, okay? And therefore, when that light is coming, we get that light, it's coming from God. We, we didn't do anything for that. The Israelites, what did they do? They slaughtered a lamb, eat it with matzah, and with the herbs, for that you get that light of redemp true redemption. Therefore, the next day the light goes away. And if you want to receive that light, you need right now to work on yourself and to draw that light. And that is the counting of the Omer, that every day during the counting of the Omer, we draw in now by our own action, one aspect of the lights that were revealed in the night on the night of the Seder. Till we come to Shavuot, and after the 49 days, we collected all of these lights. Now we can earn our own revelation of light, and that is the revelation of the studying the whole night of, of Shavuot. In the morning, we get the light of the Keter, but now of real freedom, but now because we walk. So now let's go to the Kavanot of the Seder and the Haggadah, according to Kabbalah. So we start, first of all, we know that the tree of life is the DNA of the universe. It's the main structure of the universe. Uh, whoever does not know, there's a special uh, um, little introduction of what the tree of life is about on this channel, Live Kabbalah TV. Okay, look for it, the tree of life. But the tree of life is the basic, and the whole thing is based on the tree of life, the whole thing of the Seder night. So first of all, how do you prepare the Seder night? First of all, you have to prepare the Seder plate. And the Seder plate is basically all around the tree of life. Now, how do you set the Seder plate? Ashkenazi Jews put the matzot underneath the plate. So some of them create like really elaborate um, three, four story plate. So you can put three matzot, okay? And you put the matzot under the plate. That's Ashkenazi custom. The Sephardi custom put the matzot on top of the plate, which means that are just a little bit over the plate, but the special you can buy in Judaica store. You can make it on your own. You can. Uh, it's a it's a special uh, matzah uh, bag that has three compartments. You don't have. You can take three big napkins, uh, either uh, made of uh, cotton or from a cloth or from paper, just big enough to cover. And you put. What do you do? You first you have to. So you instill the consciousness in the matzot. So you take the matzot, okay, and we'll see, and you put three matzot, three, and it's best to have three handmade matzot when shmura matzah, because that's the highest level that it's made specially for this. So uh, the first one, you call it chokhmah, the other one, second, the one underneath is bina or dad, okay? It, if you don't have that uh, fancy uh, 
uh, matzah uh, uh, plate, like you see in the picture. Then you can take uh, uh, the plate, you set a plate and put on few cups, tall cups, put it on it and underneath you can put the matzot. That's Ashkenazi tradition. The Sephardi tradition, and if you don't want to have a construction like this, you can do that, it's, it's okay. You put the matzot in, a, in that, uh, as we said, in a, bag, a matzah bag in three compartments or with three layers of, a, of napkins and you put it on top, which means on the top side of the, the, uh, of the uh, plate that it's just leaning on the plate. Now, what is the consciousness of the center plate, matzot? And that's very important according to Shara Kavanov of the Aliza. The top matzah, is Chochmah, connecting to Spirat Chochmah, the upper three, right column, and it's also connected to Kohen, the priest. You know, there are Kohen, Levi, and Israel in, uh, among the Jewish people. Kohanim are the priests, Leviim, the Levites, and Israel is all the rest. Okay? Initials, Kohen, Levi, Israel, Kli, a vessel. A real vessel has all three aspects, right, left, and center. So you take the first matzah and you say, this is Kohen, right column, Chochmah, okay? And you meditate on that matzah that it is the letter He. The letter He, remember that we had the He on the doorpost. The letter He is a symbol of the last He of the Yud Kei Vav Kei, Malchut, the vessel. So this is the Malchut, but it's the holy one. The matzah is the holy one. And if you look at it, how is the hay constructed? There is a letter Dalet, and there's inside it the letter Yud. Okay? That's what you meditate on the first matzah. Okay? And you put it on the top, among, inside the bag, under the napkin, but it's on the top of the three matzah. You take now the second matzah, and now you call it Bina, left column, Levi. But now you meditate it, that it's on it, that it's a letter A, but now it's a Dalet with a letter Vav inside, if you can see that. It's a different kind of a hay. By the way, the two hays are kosher in a, in a Torah. Okay, depends on the style, but there's two ways to write the letter A. Okay, then the third matzah, the bottom one, this is that central column, Israel. Okay? And if you look at it, it's a hay made of three vavs, three times a letter vav. Three times a letter vav, that's 666, numerical value, 18. Six, three times six, 18, chai, the power of life, which is, that's how the power of life coming down from the upper three into our physical world through the tree of life. Okay, after we put the three matzot with that consciousness, and now they're in the bag, they're covered. Okay, now we put this, the uh, ingredients of the cedar plate, which is a Star of David. Okay, so what do you have in the Star of David? You can see there like six ingredients. On the right, you see the uh, shank bone, which is called Zoa. Okay, on the left is the egg. In the middle between them, you have Mao. I'll explain each one of them, which is the uh, bitter herbs. Then you have on the bottom right, Chaoset. On the bottom left, you have Karpas. Then in the middle between them down, you have the Chazeret. And the plate itself is Firat Malchut. We have the seven lower Sephirot. Okay, so now, what, so as we said, so the first one is the chesed. The chesed, what do you do as a zua? As a zua, you take a lamb's arm, okay? Lamb, which means you buy it in the uh, uh, butcher shop, in a kosher butcher shop. You get a, a lamb and you roast it on fire and you put it there. A lot of people are, you know, don't like that stuff or they can't achieve, so you can get a chicken's neck or a chicken's wing, okay? That you put on the top right, and that's Zoa Chesed. 
And that represents the chesed, the strong arm of the creator that broke the bondage of Egypt. What can break the bondage? Only chesed, only loving kindness. When we are going through any kind of judgment and negativity, loving kindness overcoming that negativity, that's the real victory. That's the power of overcoming. That's really when we make our tikkun. So that's why the arm, the right arm of God, and that's also a memory of the, uh, it's not the uh, lamb offering of Passover, but it's a memory. of it. Gevua on the left side, which is judgment or din, it's a boiled egg. You put it on the top left. You say gevua, beitza. It symbolizes the desire and stubbornness. Because an egg, in, he, in Aramaic, egg is be'a, which is again with ba'e, which is a desire, cravings. That's a left column. Okay, there's a custom to, be, to burn it a little bit on a fire, just a little bit, and put it over there before you burn it before the holiday. If it's Shabbat, so it's before Shabbat. Tif Eret which is the middle, you have maro, the bitter herb, central column. That's a horseradish, according to the Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi Jews, okay? Or Sephardim, they use bitter leaves. It could be either the outside, uh, uh, you know, when you have a lettuce, the outside leaves that are more bitter, than the, you put the outside bigger leaves, Okay, of course, you have to culture them first so there are no, uh, with salt water, so there are no uh, bugs inside. Okay, and there are other customs for that. You can also use uh, um, uh, other bitter, uh, bitter leaves if you don't have it, so it feels bitter. To feel bitter, you can have also had some horseradish, so some do both. Okay, when we eat the maro, maro, we chew a mouthful of it with the intention of to control the power of death because maro, numerical value, is death, mavit, which is the judgment within. That's how we achieve central column, overcoming any judgment, any, any negativity, any frustration or anger. So we add to it haroset, which is the right column, to sweeten it. Okay, Netzach, on the right side below. Okay, that's Netzach, Chaoset, which is the power of life, of love, and giving and sharing. We'll explain later on what the Chazoroset is made of. Hod is Karpas, which is on the left. According to Rabbi Azakloria, it is parsley. Uh, Sephardim use a, a celery. That symbolizes judgment, suffering. We know the parsley is, is full of iron. And we dip it in salt water. Again, to sweeten, to put the uh, chesed, salt water is chesed, overcoming, overpowering with grace over the judgment. Yesod, in the middle, it's a lettuce. That's a fresh, smaller leaves and sweeter leaves of the lettuce. Okay, that's a power of balance. Malchut is the plate itself. Okay, so we said already Maror is the numerical value. You see, Mem is 40, Reish is 200, Vav is 6, Reish is 200 together, 446, which is Mavet, death. So by chewing the Maror, we, the consciousness is to overcome negativity, overcoming death, and turning it into sweetness. That's why the Talmud says you can't spit it out, you can't swallow it up. Same thing with life. Don't run away, don't suppress it. You have to chew it up till it becomes sweet. And we know the bitter stuff in those herbs is called glycosides. It's multi-sugars and we have enzymes in our saliva that if we chew it up enough, they, they, that enzyme breaks the glycosides into uh, smaller sugar molecules and then it really becomes sweet scientifically. Just patience. That's the secret of overcoming and never giving up. The haroset, the Rizal is saying the word haroset is, can be divided into root, judgments, 
Ruth the Moabite, that was the grandmother of King David, Malchut, the king, judgments, fighting, and so on. That's symbolized by Ruth. And Sach, again, in 68, life. That's the, the, the potion of life set of right color. Now, there are many traditions in every family and community. There's a different tradition of how to make haroset. Usually, it has wine, it has nuts, it has apples, and stuff like this. This is the, this is the recipe of Rabbi Isaac Luria. First of all, three spices and incense that you can find in the temple incense. The first is cinnamon. The second is ginger. Ginger is not part of the incense, but the cinnamon is. And the third is shibolet nerd, nard. Okay, there are two opinions among the great rabbis. They still not even, I call the Temple Institute. They say we wait for the Mashiach to tell us which of the two is the real nard. What is nard? So most rabbis, including the Maimonides, say nard is a plant that comes from the Himalayas. It's called Nardos Takis, uh, okay? You can find it in uh, special herb stores, okay? And, or lavender is the other opinion. It's much easier to find lavender that blooming right now, very hard, easy to find them in gardens, okay? Now, that's three spices or uh, Instances that are the upper three and seven fruits, grapes. Okay, uh, you cannot find grapes, fresh grapes. So they are today, you can find everywhere. But if you don't have grapes, you can use uh, raisins and wine or wine because wine is made of grapes. Okay, um, figs, tenim, figs, tmarim, dates, tapuchim, apples, agassim. Pears, egoze luz, it's a uh, uh, nuts, um, and and rimonim, rimonim is uh, is pomegranate, granites. If you don't find one of them, you can replace it with another fruit. Okay, but seven fruits. So you have the th upper three roots and the lower seven fruits. Okay, and that you uh, grind them together. Put them together till they look like clay in memory of the clay the Israelites used to make bricks out of. Also, it is a potion to turn every negative into positive. And that's the power of the Chavosim. That's at the bottom right side. Okay? So the left side we said is the parsley, the middle is we said the uh, is the yes, uh, sweet leaves of the lettuce. Okay, in the Seder, we have 15 stages and the beginning of the Haggadah, we pronounce all of us, everybody present, everybody pronounce, and if you can sing it, uh, you sing it together with a tune, Kadesh, Uchatz, Karpas, Yechatz, all the 15. 15 is the numerical value of Yud K, of the Yud K, Vav K, the letters in yellow, these are the upper three Keter Chochmah Bina. What does it mean? We draw, to, it's again, we draw the upper three lights only time during that night in all our activities during the Seder. The first thing is Kadesh. Before every stage of the 15, we announce the stage. It says in the Haggadah, you say Kadesh, come to Kadesh, you announce. Why? It's like pushing another key on the keyboard of moving the process forward. You have to announce with the mouth. Remember, Pesach, the mouth draws the light. Kadesh, so it's the wine. We have four cups of wine. The wine draws the energy, the light from Bina. Four cups of wine in Bina, you have four levels inside Bina. The Chochma of Bina, Bina of Bina, Zerbin of Bina, Malchut of Bina, and these are the four levels. In a Kabbalistic Haggadah, we have, you have the, uh, the marking of the four meditations for each one of the four cups. 72, 63, 45, 52, it's all the, the, the different 
uh, four frequencies in numbers, as you see it in this chart. And that is in a Kabbalistic Agada. You have it next to every cup of wine. When you come to the cup, you have the meditations over there. So if you open the, the, uh, our Kabbalistic Agada, as I said, you find the link below. Okay? Kadesh, it says, Nichnas Pimyut Chesed Deima. This is what the meditation is from uh, the Arizal. So what we get, the inner Chesed coming from Ima, from Bina, and it's the second greatness, Korch Mochin, of Ima, which means it's, as, as the Arizal explained before, it's the highest level is coming immediately already in the first cup. Moa Chochma, it's also the Moa of Chochma, not just of Bina, which is 72, because it's the, uh, the first cup of the four, which is Chochma. Nichnas Gam Katnut Shani, the second smallness is coming of Ava Ve'ima. And you have all of this, you don't have to understand, just scan it, think this is the first cup. It's all of these great lights are coming in and I'm drinking the wine in order to get it into myself. Okay, there is the Kadesh, the head, everybody holds the cup and standing. The head of the table says the blessing for everybody else. Everybody says amen and drinks, but follow the blessings. If it is at a, a weekday, a regular Sunday night, Monday night and so, there is a simple blessing of the holiday of Passover. If it is Friday night, you have you add, and it's all the Agadas have it, you add a special edition for Shabbat. If it is in the end of Shabbat, like this year, uh, 2021, the end of the Passover Seder is the end of Shabbat, you also say Havdalah. The blessings of Havdalah, you add them, it's in the, um, and then you say the blessing over the candles that were lit before. Okay, how do you light them? After Shabbat is over, the women can light, you have to leave a memorial candle that light, that burns from before Shabbat. So you have a burning candle in the end of Shabbat. You can take light, a fire from there, light the, the holiday candles, okay? If there are women in the house, they light it. If there are no women in the house, the men have to light the candles with a blessing before the Seder begins before the Seder begins. And then you have candle lights. You can do the blessing over the lights of the candle. Okay, there's no blessing over the herbs, uh, in, like in a regular Havdala, because we are not falling to weekdays. It's still a holiday. So you do the special Havdala from Shabbat to week to holiday. And it's in all Haggadot. You'll have the text and the uh, instructions over there. In the end, we say Sheikhayanu, then we sit and we drink while leaning on the left. While leaning on the left, the left is the sign of the desire to receive, correct? So that's leaning on the left. So every time we, we, we do a special thing, it says in the Agada, in all Agadas, it's instructed, lean on the left. While leaning on the left, the right has to be over the left. Sharing and caring has always be, must always be before and over judgment and taking and selfishness. That's, this is the formula for victory for the whole year. Then we do Urchatz, that's a second. Again, it's a stage, we announce Urchatz. And then Nichnas Gadut Sheni Kanal, again, the second greatness, Mochin is coming in. You have all the uh, frequency over here, scan it. Then everybody washes hands without saying the blessing. Just washing hands like before bread without saying the blessing. Just washing. That's how you bring in that great light. Very simple. Then when we come to the matzah, we know there are four portions of matzah that we eat this night. Four portions of anti-evil inclination um, remedies. The matzot are from chokhmah. We said that the wine is from bina. The matzot getting the power from chokhmah, four different portions of matzah, again, four levels of meditations. Chokhmah, bina, zampin, malchut of chokhmah. Now remember the three levels of the matzot in the Seder plane. Okay, 
when we come to the stage that is called yachatz, okay, splitting, what we do, if you see over there, we have the three matzot. The top matzah, chokhmah, is dalet yud. The middle matzah, bina, is left column, dalet vav. The bottom matzah is that, central column, three vavs. What we do in the, in the yachatz, the head of the table takes the middle matzah out of the matzah bag, and in front of everybody, he breaks it into two pieces. What happened? Now you have two pieces, dalet and vav. Now, the big piece, the vav, why vav? Here it looks smaller. No, but vav is the number six, and dalet is the number four. So, that, so six is bigger than four. The big piece is the fikoma. That piece is getting into another bag that you have to prepare in advance, that you have another bag to put it inside. That's a piece that you hide for the rest of the seder. The other piece, the smaller piece, okay, that's a dalit. You put it back in its previous place between the two matzot. When the vav is hidden, during the whole night of Passover, that's the birth of Zeranpin that we are midwifing the whole night, the consciousness. That's why the last thing we eat the night of Passover is from the Afikoma. That's a fourth portion of the matzah and the most important, don't forget it. There's a tradition that the kids steal that. And that's why it keeps them awake because they want to negotiate what present they get for giving it. But if it's very small kids, I don't know if you can trust them. You better sometimes uh, have a fake of Ikoman and hide it in a safe place. Because who knows where they go to put it and they fight over it and they break it and make it chametz because they put it on the floor. Uh, depends how do you trust the kids and how old they are. Okay, so what, what, so what do we do with the three matzot? It's all said in the Haggadah. All Agadot, it's the instructions are there. The upper matzah is being eaten when we do hamotzi, matzah, eh, motzi matzah, eh, and we eat the first matzah. And with the first blessing of the matzah, we eat the upper one, okay, and the middle one. So when we do the, the, the blessing, when the head of the table is doing the blessing, he gives small pieces from the upper matzah and the middle matzah to every participant. And because you eat, you need to eat kazait, which is 28 uh, grams. It's an ounce. It's like a regular square matzah size. Okay, some say. Everybody should according to his tradition, but it says how much it is. Okay, you have to eat during that two portions, two pieces of matzah together with the small pieces with the original cedar plate matzah. Okay? And the, uh, as we said, the fikoma, that the one that we took in the previous stage stays for the last stage of the uh, seder, which is called safun. The other, the other matzah, the bottom matzah, is being eaten when we do the sandwich. In Hebrew, the word for sandwich is karich. That's why it's called korech, making a sandwich. So you make the sandwich from the bottom matzah together with the haroset, and the maror and the, chaz and the lettuce. Okay, so all of that we have together. We have the stages magid, as we said, pesach, the mouth bringing life by saying the, the agada and singing and saying the halal. We're bringing the energy of life for our body and our soul for the rest of the year. So when we speak about the four sons, it's yud kei vav ke. Four questions, yud kei vav ke. Again, we are midwifing that consciousness for us and for the whole world. So, to summarize everything up, on the night of the Seder, we have one goal, says Rabbi Nisim Peretz, which is to remove and cancel and annul any kind of klipa, shells, negativity from our lives. From now on, there's no klipa, no angel of death, no evil inclination. Everything is being sweetened in its source because by the end of the Seder, we are really flying to the heavens in, and we attain the level of greatness that allows us
to have this clarity and epiphany and the ability to see like we can't see any other time. And so that's the purpose of the Seder. So as we said, how can we have freedom just from that? We have, now it disappears, but at least we feel, how does it feel to be free? So we know what to work for during the 49 days of the Omer and during the night of Shavuot, so we can get the manifestation of that freedom in the morning of Shavuot, in the rain of the Torah. The first week, so there are seven weeks of the counting of the Omer. The first week is corresponding to Chesed, which is the Sfira that includes all the others. That's why there's so much light in the first week, and therefore it is not weekdays, but it's Chol Moed. It's a holiday that is semi-weekdays. So in the synagogue, it's like a holiday. There's Hallel, there's Musaf, reading of the Torah, every day of the, se the first week. But you can light fire, you can buy stuff if you really need and stuff like this. You better not work. This is a time for contemplation, celebration, being with the family, and so on. Or the seventh day of Pesach, the light of Chesed completes coming in. That's why it's a holiday of itself, which is called the seventh day of Pesach. Okay? This is the same day also of the splitting of the Red Sea and the miracle of the 72 names. And that's a miracle coming from Keter. That is like we get a sample of the lights we are going to get in Shavuot. So I hope it was not too long. Every, I wish everybody a happy, amazing holiday of freedom and uh, best wishes for all of us.